The second form of capital is what I call spiritual capital. Now, I know that the moment I say spiritual, many people's minds will run to the church, to the mosque, or even to the traditional shrine. Yes, that is part of the picture, but it's not the whole picture. In life, the most ferocious forces, the most forceful forces, the most powerful forces are invisible. They are not visible. We only know about their prevalence and power by their effect. Look at the wind. You will know its power by how much it shakes the trees, by how much it blows and lifts up the dust, by how much energy it generates from the windmills. You can't see the wind. You only see it by its effect. Very, very powerful. From the, the Christian background where I come from, we recite the creed. I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. And somewhere in that creed, it talks about God as the creator of things visible and invisible. The invisible bit is what I am focusing on in spiritual capital. Spiritual capital includes things like your values, your personal values. The, the people who value trustworthiness, dependability, creativity, freedom, and so many other things. What are your personal values? That is a component of your spiritual capital. What is your belief system? There's a guy called uh, Anthony Robbins. I've been mentored by many people who don't know me who will never meet me, perhaps, who I have just met through books. And a guy called, a life coach called Anthony Robbins happens to be a guy who has mentored me since the year 2000. I read uh, one of his books, Unlimited Power, that impacted me a lot. I read it in 2000. Then later on, I read his other book, Awaken the Giant Within. I think I read it around 2002. And in that book, Awaken the Giant Within, Anthony Robbins says, if you are not happy with the results you are getting from your endeavors, there are three things that you need to change. First, he says, Change your limiting beliefs. S 
if you believe you cannot, you won't. Because you won't even have the energy. If you, if you believe by virtue of your age, you cannot start a business. By virtue of your gender, I can, you cannot do this. By virtue of the course I have studied, I cannot belief system. Some people believe no one can stand in my way unless I give them permission to do that. Some people strongly believe in the power and influence of their God. That even when they face the hardest of times, they resort to solutions from that their God. I happen to be one of those. And that belief, strong belief in that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the belief in the power of Jesus Christ. Now, this is my personal stance. This is where I come from. That has worked for me. Yours could be different. But the point I'm trying to explain is belief system is a component of your spiritual capital. There are also aspects like persistence, your ability to persist despite. Because you see, I have seen a lot of people starting projects. Someone meets a challenge, another challenge, and another challenge along the way, and they're like, no, 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 no. This is not for me. So that one drops out of business. And another person meets similar challenges, even more often, and is hard hit, harder than the other one who dropped out, but then this latter refuses to quit. How do you explain that? The persistence in these two cases, the levels of persistence, is eventually what makes the difference between the one who drops out and the one who hangs in there until they meet their breakthrough point. So you see, in fact, the one who has dropped out of business might even be having more money and more other advantages. You've been around people like that. Perhaps you, you yourself, you are an embodiment of what I'm talking about. Now, you may not have thought about it, but I'm here to tell you the good news that it is your spiritual capital that has seen you rise. Going through insurmountable odds where everybody else would have given up, you hung in there. Why did you hang in there? Because you have resilience. You have persistence. Resilience is spiritual force. Persistence is a spiritual force. The other spiritual force is a strong sense of purpose. That because you have this very strong sense of purpose, no, this is what I was born to do. This is my purpose. This is where my destiny is. Life, as it usually does, it will hit you with its blows, and its blows are usually so hard. But you'll hang in there because you are like, no, I cannot divert. This is my purpose. You've met people. You may be having them in your family. They may be your classmates in high school, in university, in primary, and you know, these are guys who, who say, you know, I never quit. Why I never quit? Because they have figured out 
I have a friend, Lawrence Namale. He's, he's, he always focuses on purpose. He has written books on purpose. All his pod podcasts in their thousands, they are on one thing, purpose from different dimensions. How do you discover your purpose? And how do you live up to your purpose? Because purpose is such a powerful spiritual force that it will help. And where you don't have sense of purpose, however much money you'll have, however much other forms of capital you'll have, purpose is a key driving force. And that's a spiritual force. Pegged to purpose is sense of mission. I told you at the beginning of this video that my mission is to help individuals and organizations discover their potential and become the best they can be. Everything I do in my life for the last more than 26 years has been that. Those who know me will tell you, very consistent, same thing. I will just change strategy from teaching in a classroom to training corporates at the beaches, in hotels and wherever, doing power powerful, energetic, team building activities in the jungle or in the fields. But it's all focused in there. Purpose. So at the end of the day, when you put those together, your sense of vision, all of those are spiritual forces. When you put these together, they constitute what I have called spiritual capital in this model. That is capital number two. Now, I have been privileged to work as a consultant for all sorts of organizations. And at all levels, really. And I find that the leaders who transform their organizations, who lead their organizations into excellence, will normally have a very powerful dose of spiritual capital, a powerful sense of resolve, that's a spiritual force. They will have it. And because of that, they will develop other capabilities, such as the ability to influence everybody around them to move in the direction of their, their sense of purpose and their vision. I have also worked as a consultant for some celebrated entrepreneurs. And I find that spiritual capital is something they have in a strong dose. That when everybody else is dozing, it is 3 a.m. in the night, and this person, the person will have all the money. They are rich, extremely rich. But they are the ones who are awake at 3 a.m. brainstorming on strategy, on how to clinch the next deal, on how to make a breakthrough. Huh? They have all the money that the rest of us are looking for. Why are they awake at 3 a.m. in the night? 
What keeps them awake? Spiritual capital. They have a, a cool sense of purpose, cool sense of mission. They have this powerful resilience. They have this persistence. They are hanging in there. That explains why they are where they are, why, why they are what they are. Look at yourself. Ask yourself how many times you've tried this and given up. You've tried that and given up. How many times you've resigned in your heart. How many times you've told yourself things are impossible? Simply because you don't have the energy to keep moving. In other words, what you do not have in adequate deposits is spiritual capital. And that tells you that is your homework. You'll ask me, but how do you accumulate spiritual capital? And I'll quickly take you back to the first form of capital, the intellectual capital. You remember I talked about your exposure. Many of the things that have shaped me, as I did say already, are things I have learned from mentors I have never met except in the books they have written. I spent many years, even before Madiba, Mandela died, trying to study and understand what ma made Madiba, Madiba. How do you explain his emotional intelligence? For me, the time, those last years when he, he, he lived, I took him to be the icon, the embodiment of emotional intelligence still alive. By reading his works and the works about him and watching the documentaries and his philosophies. By reading uh, uh, Anthony Robbins and I, 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 in the early 2000s, I used to have a lot of tapes of Anthony Robbins' audios. And by then we were using cassettes. Uh, the, the CDs were very, very scarce. Very expensive also, CD players in cars. So I used the cassettes. And I would listen to Anthony Robbins over and over again. I would read his books. And that shaped my emotional intelligence. It shaped my sense of focus and purpose. It shaped my resilience, my persistence, and so on. So if you ask me, how do I accumulate? I mean, take it to the common level where we know it from. How do you become a strong Christian or a strong Muslim? Among other things, it's hard to do that without reading the Bible, the Quran. I'll stick to what I know best. How do you even become a deeply a deep Christian without reading the Bible? How? You'll easily be shaken. If you don't know his word, eh? because he speaks through his word. So he encourages you through his word. And I'll tell you the same thing. You build spiritual capital by exposing yourself. By, because when you expose yourself, you get to appreciate that what you originally thought was impossible is actually possible because you have read people who have made a breakthrough who were in situations that were worse than your situation and they have managed to make a breakthrough. And so what that does is to change your belief system to become an impossibilities-oriented person to become a person that is oriented to possibilities. So you become a possibility thinker instead of an impossibility thinker. You see? Already. 
by being exposed to other people's life experiences. I mean, you listen to a guy like Pastor Wilson Bugembe, and I mean, you establish, you get to learn. He was a street guy, and, and look where he is. And, and then he says, oh, so it's possible. If someone in a worse situation can make it, then. So that's how spiritual capital gets formed and, and transformed and gets shaped. Capital number three is what many of you, I'm sure, have heard. And you have heard it being, the phrase being used many times. But maybe you haven't paid enough attention to it. And that is something we call social capital. Uh -huh. That must be a concept you are familiar with. You've heard it at least. I, I, I think among the people who understand social capital very well are the Rotarians. Rotary Club helps people to build their social capital. Social capital is about who knows you? Who do you know? Who are you connected to? Who will easily, quickly get concerned when you are in need? But in order for you to arrive at that, you have to go back to the first two capitals. Intellectual capital and the spiritual capital. Those two are very vital for you to build your social capital. Because in order for people to continuously associate with you and keep wanting to associate with you. There, in all honesty, there must be value that you add to them. The higher the value that you add to people, the higher their propensity to want to associate with you. Why will someone be keen on picking their phone and calling you today and tomorrow and the other day? Why do they, have want, to, why do they want to have conversations with you? Why do they want to have appointments with you? Why do they want to have a coffee moment with you? Why do they want to make sure that you know when there is an opportunity for a seminar or any other opportunity, job opportunity, why would they want to have you benefit? There must be an attachment they have with you. There must be a value that you have added to their lives in the past or you continue to add to their lives or you are, your presence actually makes them feel good or feel energized. So, the clubs you belong to, that's your social capital. The associations you belong to, that's your social capital. The church you go to, the mosque or whatever other groups that you associate with, that's your social capital. The institutions you are attached to, the professional bodies you are attached to, if you're a lawyer, the, the, uh, the lawyer's fraternity, if you are an accountant, the, the accountant's fraternity, the marketers, you see the marketers always have these marketers night and so on and so forth. That is your social capital. Now, I'll tell you, if I were to be honest, coming this far where I am now, it is social capital that has made me. In fact, I doubt this concept of self-made man, 
self-made made woman. Ah, is that possible? To be self-made? Self-made, made. Because by the time you rise to where you are, there is a big network of people who have contributed to raising you up. Even if you are the boss and all you have are employees, these employees, you take them out of your equation, your business crumbles. So your employees are also part of your social capital. Uh -huh. I published my first book in, in the year 2000. And after launching it, one month down the road after launching it, I got an invitation to Cambridge University to make a presentation about the ideas in my book. That book, the title was Self-Discovery, Remaking the Youth. See, when I tell you all my working years are focused on youth, that's, that's what I mean. And I met a guy, he was called Michael Ward. He worked at the British Council in Kampala, but he had gone to Cambridge for that conference. The conference was coded um, Voices for Change. It was a conference looking at how do we transform education systems around the world. And the ideas I had written in that book were in that direction. That's why I was invited to make the presentation. So Michael Ward waits for me at the exit of the conference room and hands me his business card and tells me, when you come back to Kampala, visit me at my office and we'll have a conversation about these powerful ideas that you have been talking about on how to transform education. The year is 2000. And I will tell you, I never looked back since then. That's when I discovered, actually, after that book, that I can be a, a good author who writes things that can make sense to people's lives. But the major point I want to, to share with you on this is that the money I used to print my first book was not my money. It was a student, I was by then a master's student at Uganda Matters University. And a, a bachelor's student in her second year, she was a Catholic nun. She was under scholarship. And they would send her money for a year, two semesters. And she happened to read uh, my manuscript, the book, and she fell in love with it. And so every time she would meet me and ask me, Ambrose, when are you printing the book? And I would tell her, I have not even completed paying my, <clears throat> my tuition. So maybe after graduating is when I'll print the book. And she kept telling me, this book is so important. This book is so rich. It's going to change many people's lives. Then one day, I meet her at the dining, and she asks me, Ambrose, have you found the money? I told her, sister, I told you. I, I'll print this book after graduating. Then she engaged me in a conversation and asked me, but Ambrose, tell me, if I lent you my money, and that's, by the way, my tuition fees for next semester, Will you be able to pay back that money before next semester? And I told her a grand yes. Where was I getting my confidence from? I had a big network. I had big social capital. So none of the money I used was mine. She lent me the money. 
I was reaching out to secondary schools, providing voluntarily, on voluntary basis. I used to provide career guidance in a number of secondary schools. Gayaza High School was one of them. This is 98, 99, 2000, 2001. So yeah, I had Gayaza High School, I had all the St. Lawrence schools, I had uh, Lubaga Girls, I had Budo SS, I had uh, Africana Whiteland College, I think that's where there is Seroma now, and a couple of other schools. So I had this network, Trinity College in Abingo, I had this network of schools. So I knew that once I had the money, I would do a launch. I did a launch at Hotel Africana, it hit very big. Within two weeks, I had paid back the money. And the point I'm making is, sometimes the money we need is not going to come from our initial efforts. It's going to come from our social capital. It's going to come from our intellectual capital. It's going to come from our spiritual capital. And so when you think about capital, don't think about money, the first thing. Think about all the, four, the, the six forms of capital and then figure out how the equation is going to work, when do you need which capital and in which quantities? And then you mix them up to create what you want. In the next video, <clears throat> what we'll be focusing on is time as capital. Because I, I know time is actually arguably the mother of accumulating the other capitals and utilizing them as well. Thank you very much for watching. If you have enjoyed the video, click the like button and go ahead and click the subscribe button. And don't forget to leave a comment or question so that we can keep the conversation rolling. Thank you for having me.